If you spent any time looking through smart TVs, smart streaming sticks, and other things to deliver content to your smart home TV or entertainment system, then I'm sure you're pretty confused at this point. And so I put together today's video to help you make the right decisions with your smart home entertainment system. Hello automators, thanks for tuning in again. I'm Brian from Automate Your Life and today I'm going to take the frustration out of automation by helping you sort through a pretty tough uh, piece of the smart home industry here or really a pretty tough thing to sort through with all the different options that we have out there. And this is really going to break down into how we deal with a smart TV or a smart streaming device and how we get content onto that device. I'm not going to go through the entire smart home entertainment experience today. I actually initially planned it that way this video and it's just too large of a topic so I'm going to kind of break that out for a topic later. Now this question was posed by Erin and she's one of our patrons over on Patreon and she had a really good point. I, this is a tough thing to, to sort through and so I'm going to start by walking through some of the different options that you have and we're going to start with the biggest component and that's the TV itself and I think what you're going to find with the smart TVs is that there are a number of options out there so you can with some of the smaller size TVs go out and buy a non-smart TV. I actually did that recently and it was just for a very small TV and so you can still do that a little bit but in general you're going out and you're buying a smart TV almost every time. Now those smart TVs I'll tell you I have a seven-year-old uh, Samsung TV, I have a six-year-old Panasonic TV and all of them or both of them have smart applications or smart TV components so they have applications one of them has a browser on board my TVs in my home have cameras they have the ability to video chat with certain applications and they even had at one point on my Samsung TVs a voice control component and these smart TVs when you look to kind of the newest versions of, of things like LG's ThinQ series of TVs you know those have Google Assistant integration or on board in some cases some of these TVs and they have the ability to do things like AirPlay 2 for Apple products. They have entire app stores and, and the ability to download all kinds of applications. They have browsers. They have voice search capabilities. So they have everything that you would kind of consider part of a modern smart TV. On that note, Amazon has Fire TVs with brands like Toshiba. They have an Insignia Fire TV at Best Buy as well. So they have a couple of other partners that they've put this Fire TV platform into and then Roku has actually done the same thing with a set of TCL branded televisions where they've put their Roku service onto those TV and that kind of leads me into talking about some of the streaming devices that we have out there and available and we last talked about Roku so I'll talk about their streaming devices now they have or they have been for a long time one of the biggest names in the streaming industry a lot of people love the interface love the applications they have a lot of great features and a lot of great services to pick from they give you a great little remote although it's not my favorite remote uh, at least not the older versions and some of their newer versions are going to come with a voice assistant on board or voice search and voice control actually with their streaming stick they have HD and 4k options as well and they have little games that you can play although you can't really pair controllers like you can with some of the other devices that I'm going to talk about and they don't really have an onboard browser for you to go and navigate the web Although in a lot of cases, I'll tell you, you're not going to do that with the browsers that you do have access to with these streaming devices. Previously, we talked about Amazon putting their Fire TV into some TVs, but they also have Fire TV sticks. Now, this is the remote that comes with all of their Fire TV devices at this point, or at least all of the ones that I have. The Fire TV, the Fire TV 4K, and 
Fire TV Cube as well, which we'll talk about a little more. But they have a great interface, similar a lot to TCL or Roku here with their streaming sticks. They have a number of different applications, a number of different services. The real differences here is they do have the Amazon Voice Assistant on board this remote. They also have the ability to navigate through pretty well using that voice control through browsers, they have two onboard browsers, and they also have a newer library of games than say Roku there, who has kind of an older library of games that you can play with their remote. Now Google enters into the game with their Chromecast devices. Now they have a Chromecast, a Chromecast 4K, which is called the Ultra Edition, and that's really the differential between the devices. There's really not much else uh, between a Chromecast and a Chromecast Ultra. But the difference with their platform from say Roku and Amazon is that they're not using an app-based navigation. What they're actually doing is leaving you reliant on a smartphone or a tablet in your home and then utilizing a cast button which is on a ton of applications and there's a real genius to this implementation of streaming or, or using you know your other devices in your home it keeps their costs relatively low with these kinds of devices and it gives you access to unlimited services it's basically whoever wants to be able to cast their content to a Chromecast. They also have a couple of interesting capabilities so the Chromecast Ultra will have Google Stadia service so that's the gaming service coming here where you'll be able to play games on that device so that could be very powerful for us and the other thing is the ambient mode or what is essentially a digital photo frame is probably one of my favorite uh, streaming device capabilities or features and it just allows you to sit and have pictures rotated through but you can also kind of do it through your phone and cast pictures to that and cast a slideshow to it so you can show people albums that you've created for say a trip or for something your family was doing so very powerful stuff there actually now on that note when we're kind of talking about google based options their android boxes or the myriad of android boxes out on the market today allow a lot of different streaming capabilities and and they have access to all kinds of Android applications. They allow gaming through controllers and probably the pinnacle of the Android boxes is the Nvidia Shield. Now that device has been really well kept up to date by Nvidia. They are coming out with a new version but the price just went way up on what we're talking about. Now all of those Android applications, the streaming options and all of the gaming capabilities that is on board and embedded into the Nvidia Shield is very, very powerful. So this is a great option to look at as well. Which moves us into talking about something that's a little more expensive as well and more of a box similar to the Nvidia Shield and that is the Apple TV service. And there's a lot to like about that device. You get games, you get all of or a ton of applications that you get with Apple's platform. I mean, Apple's really done a very good job in making sure that your iPhone has the same applications and with their new arcade service, I just saw this very recently, you can literally take a game from your phone or your iPad and then move it onto Apple TV, play with a controller, very powerful stuff. You of course have the same browser on board and then you have access to Apple TV and a number of other services services as well. So their Apple TV starts to look a lot like Amazon and uh, TCL or Roku's options there for streaming devices. The one other thing about Apple's TV, although it is more expensive, it is a HomeKit hub. So it allows you to actually leave that in your home and it's probably the best choice right now for a lot of people because you're going to take an iPad and the HomePod is extremely expensive so you don't necessarily want those as your HomeKit hub but the Apple TV acts as that. Now moving on we talked a little bit about Amazon's Fire TV Cube but the latest generation adds something to the whole mix. Now it has that same interface here with the Fire TV sticks, but it also has the ability to control some of your IR based devices. So this includes your TV, this includes things like Blu-ray players or home theater systems in some cases. And Amazon kind of wants you to check right now because they don't have a full library, but the Fire TV Cube, the second generation, really brings a lot of additional capabilities there to kind of controlling your overall system. Now there are other options like 
like that. Broadlink has the RM series of devices which are IR based controls. I've uh, worked with the SwitchBot extensively here in my home and it's been able to control a ton of different devices. Not quite as much as say the big, the big dog on the market here which is the Harmony Hub which is essentially an entire IR based controller and it, it can as well control ethernet devices. If you're not sitting there saying whoa then I mean you got a bigger brain than I do and there are more devices out there. I'm not going to talk about every one out there. If there's something you feel I'm missing go ahead and leave that down below but let's get into some of the recommendations some of the things that i'm going to tell you from my experience and from what i've learned from you my viewers on youtube here there's honestly no nice way to say this and i know lots of us have gone out and bought smart tvs and we're reliant on them right now but the fact of the matter is i have yet to see a smart home or a smart tv platform a smart tv service be unscathed over five years I have lost features of all kinds on all of my TVs. Applications disappear because they're no longer maintained for that platform or they're not secure, or they're not safe, and they just go away. I have yet to see all of the features of a, a supposed smart TV be maintained. I've lost simple things like Bluetooth connectivity because it's no longer being maintained for that operating system that's on the TV. I've lost things like access to a camera or video calls or a browser any of those things can go at any point and i think that's the first thing i want to eliminate it's not that you can go out and buy tvs without smart components unless you buy a really small tv then you can do it but you know i don't think you want to be reliant on that and that's kind of the point i'm making don't be reliant on that service working you know there's a there's a great example with lots of the lg tvs from a year ago or a couple years ago and really any cast enabled or chromecast built-in tvs they just didn't work for almost a whole year and there are still people struggling with getting those to integrate with the Google Assistant. And I've seen the same thing with any TV capability or service that connects to these other makers. So while these features are great when you go and buy the TV, what I'm telling you is don't be reliant on this to provide content to you and to provide a great experience to you. All those features, treat them as a nice to have and start the trend a different way and and the fact is these companies just can't keep up with all the different components in all of their TVs as they release a new TV every year they upgrade their operating systems they upgrade these different components they can't keep up it's never gonna happen and that brings me to another device unfortunately and I hate to say this because I've used the Harmony Hub for a long time but I'm going to eliminate that device at this point. It hasn't kept up with the times. It's not getting the right updates and its integration with these devices continues to break constantly. So what I end up having is a great remote that I can control lots of my components in my smart, enter or my smart TV and my smart entertainment system, but their benefits uh, just aren't weighing out versus as simple as some of the other devices that I have now. If you're someone who owns a number or a few of Amazon's voice assistant devices, I think it's pretty easy to say you should probably go get a Fire TV stick, uh, a 4K version or a Fire TV cube depending on your needs for IR based control and resolution. That's pretty easy to kind of go and say, okay, break off that way. The same thing with Google. They have the best integration with their Chromecast devices. If you're someone who heavily uses the Google Assistant, there's a lot of great integrations there and then you're just going to know that you're going to use your phone or tablet as a controller for that device. And why I kind of go back to these is these are cornerstone devices for these companies. And while we saw the Chromecast audio get eliminated here recently by Google, and I'm sure we'll see some of the Fire TVs start to drop off at some point, in general, the platform is being maintained, managed, and pushed forward, and they're trying to get more and more powerful. A great example of that is Disney Plus will show up here on the Chromecast first. So you're going to have access to that brand new service here. And Amazon's done really well, you know, when you kind of 
look at the different services like Crave, Building, and Growing, and it shows up here. And so this is kind of my first recommendation. Whether you want the interface on the TV or you want the interface for control on a smartphone or a tablet is really the first decision. You can go and you can pair with these, but in both cases, these work with the other platform. They don't work in terms of, hey, turn on the Google Chromecast if you're over here on an Amazon device. They don't work that way, but you're just using a smartphone to turn on content 99% of the time. On the flip side, I utilize Google Assistant way more than I use Amazon's voice assistant, but I have one of these in my smart home and I utilize this way more than I do the Chromecast. So that's just my personal preference. And that's kind of the thing I'm telling you is pick based more on your personal preference for how you're going to control it. And then you're only spending 30 or $40 on one of these smaller streaming sticks. You can spend more on the 4K edition if you have that need, or you can spend on the IR or the Nvidia Shield to kind of go up in in control options and geek sort of options with gaming and, and things like that. But you can be really, really inexpensive with just one of these streaming devices and then later add the other one when there's a streaming service that you want access to. So if you go and buy a Fire TV stick but you want Disney Plus, pretty easy to go out and pay $35 for Disney Plus get a Chromecast and cast it from your phone. Now, of course, there's a ton more to talk about. We can talk about lighting. We can talk about how to trigger automations at different times. We can talk about how to maintain the temperature in the room. And there's a ton of other things that you might wanna do, including synchronizing lighting. And those kinds of things are capable at this point. So what we'll do is we'll create a partner video to this about your smart home entertainment system in general. Talk about those sound bars, talk about receivers, all of those different components. So that will show up and it will be available on the playlist you're seeing right now, which is all of the components of your smart home entertainment system. You can go learn more there. Now, of course, as always, thanks for watching and of course, don't hate, automate.